Uh, historically, religion has generally been considered the most exploitive system of ideology, repeatedly reinscribed throughout the concrete superstructures, social organizations, bureaucratic machinery, and institutional authorities that control the masses <coughs> through economic, cultural, and political hege hegemonies imposed by the ruling classes. This is why to this day and in most parts of the world, including developing democratic countries, religion, either explicitly or implicitly, dictates the way we think and largely determines the social roles people play in human interactions and communal life. God is the most sublime object of ideality because it is socio-symbolically presented historically as the ultimate holy object a desired ideal truth worthy of devotional worship and sustained through false consciousness that prevents people from seeing how things truly are. As a result, people psychologically construct their own realities through elaborate fantasy systems that are superimposed on imaginary constructions of divine otherness, which are unconsciously fortified and socially maintained. This is why it is impossible to escape ideology, for no one can stand outside of the socio-political matrix that constitutes a given social order, whether in a religious national state or not. Philosopher and cultural critic Slavoj Žižek has spent most of his career unmasking the various ideological mechanisms, hegemonies, and fantasy scenarios at play in greater society, and inflected through the divided subject that wants social stability and civic responsibility on the one hand, yet at the same time to unconsciously indulge the jouillance through the excessive enjoyment of breaking prohibitions while simultaneously maintaining the sense of belongingness to the collective. To summarize Zizek's position, I ideology consists of a relatively fluid set of representations that constitutes social subjectivity, together with a core of communal practices that condition the unconscious libidinal investments of subjects in their political community. These libidinal investments are structured by unconscious social fantasy and belast the subject's political allegiances with a kernel of enjoyment, which determines a relatively fixed loyalty to the institutional rituals of the political community. In other words, ideologies are necessary illusions based on collective identifications that allow for social cohesion only on the condition that certain unconscious fantasies may be entertained and enjoyed. In, Le in applying a Lacanian framework, Zizek focuses on various aspects of ideology that interpolate the subject through the imaginary, symbolic, and real registers hence Lacan's trinity, that, that condition social fantasies through reinforced modes of institutionalization. We may easily see how this applies to organized religion, where cultural indoctrination and free-floating signifiers issued from the symbolic and begotten in the imaginary threaten to extract or steal the subject's enjoyment to such a degree that one is compelled to drop to their knees in submission and worship the holy big other in order to alleviate the lack and secure a modicum of pleasure. Here we may view religion with its various imagery and nodal meaning structures as homologous to a dialectical oscillation between good and bad, ideal and base, that eclipses the individual for the social fantasy whereby the human agent becomes enveloped in an ontic web of tensions assaulted by master signifiers that have no final meaning, issued by the desire of the other as demand and lack. God is ultra signifier as absolute master, name of the father, castrating semiotic, and so forth. Only to simmer in the purgatory remainder or void where object petit a, that unattainable fantasy object peculiar to each person, resides. The reflective intellect that dares to critique the ideology of the God posit that has indelibly invaded the mass psyche will inevitably encounter the paranoid epistemological position 
that militates against the unconscious infighting of negation that threatens to eradicate the ideal. Negating God is never an easy psychological maneuver for those who have identified with and internalized this cultural signifier as an idealized psychic introject, because it means negating one's own interior as an osmotic naturalized truth, hence, hence one's felt visceral identity with the object of identification. As Zizek puts it, the God semiotic speaks to the subject as, I am what is lacking in you. With my devotion to you, with my sacrifice for you, I will fill you out. I will complete you. Here the double reflection of the dialectic says, I am what you want, yet I'm unattainable. On a psychological plane, I have witnessed patients agonize over their inner spiritual ambivalence and even admit this of myself, as well as observed how certain destructive processes are released, such as masochistic, self-flagellating, internal persecutory tendencies, and even suicidal self-negation, which transpire as modes of self-punishment for abnegating the golden idol, the very object we crave as mortals who experience, feel, and suffer. Negating God, the sublime object of ideality, is tantamount to the most unforgivable form of obscene sacrilege, so much so that it becomes sin, a prohibitive sentence ruled by death. Here the moral of the story becomes, never question the ideal. This is the supreme instantiation of ideology. You are not allowed to think. Moreover, you don't want to. And if you dare, be prepared for the paranoic remainder lying dormant in the gaps, not to mention the residue of melancholia that lingers beneath our traumatic anxiety, distracting us from our unconscious loss. Regardless of religious identificatory variances, these inner dynamic conflicts, conflicts spur both ideological battles between every part aspect of oneself or sub-selves, so to metaphorically speak, that have an endless stream of micro-agents with their own fantasy preferences that retaliate and dialectically protest with one another as political reactionaries, which can further lead to an internal war between hegemonies that inform split-off aspects of the self until they are brought together under some unity principle what we may attribute to God as a unifying unifier. But this unity principle has a tough road to hoe when libidinal, destructive, and ideological mechanisms interpenetrate one another and suffuse the human condition with competing agendas. The individual is ultimately left with the anxiety of mollifying a torturous holy other, the holy thing that institutes the law yet allows for us to bask in the ecstasies of our juillions, namely the painful realm of excess, where a perverse enjoyment occurs when we transgress our own moral prohibitions, one so-called instituted by God, only to be left with self-reproach, insatiability with no meal, and a foreclosure of certainty, for our object of desire is unknowable and inaccessible, as it is unconsciously barred and lies outside the scope of symbolic articulation. No wonder why humanity is neurotic. In depicting how the pleasure principle operates in culture, Robert Fowler, an Austrian, argues that illusions with no proper owner or author largely structure the way our individual and social practices are defined, and hence determine how we think and behave without us being properly aware of them as such. This cultural phenomenon assumes that illusions exist independently of those who carry them, yet they are simultaneously the disavowed illusions of others the subject unconsciously identifies with. In other words, the masses live in a fantasy world fashioned for them by anonymous others that have no discernible source.
media, Hollywood, politicians, the church, the ideological state apparatus, all function in ways to solidify illusions we do not question and live by every day. Moreover, we desire and expect them to and do not want them to disappear. For example, television, on, <coughs> online forums, and social media have replaced respectable journalism and peer-reviewed newspapers as credible sources of news. When they are largely epistemologically corrupt and disseminate inaccurate information that is accepted at face value by a mindless public, film and movie producers fulfill the fantasies of viewers by depicting totally fabricated and unrealistic situations as, quote, really real. Church and state have their own propaganda machines, whether this be informing the congregation on how to get to heaven or the citizenry on how wonderful the government serves the polis, while all along engaging in pedophilic cover-ups and illegal backdoor shenanigans. And politicians will say anything to get a vote by attempting to portray themselves in totally inauthentic and dishonest ways simply because that is what they think is expected of them by society. Here the populace becomes like Pavlovian dogs waiting for the bell to ring. Or they can hardly wait to have their fair trade coffee furnished by the uh, chimera of ethical capitalism. Or get home to watch their favorite television reality series, uh, attend sporting events, and perform their daily rituals such as playing with their electronic devices, download a new app, piddle around while surfing the internet or on social media, or waiting for the next text message or email to arrive, as though life depends upon that next information bite. These routine distractions are laced with illusions, yet we know they are not entirely what they claim to be. But the fantasy itself carries with it a modicum of enjoyment we immerse ourselves in despite knowing otherwise. Within myriad contexts, such as in popular culture, mass media, and religion, masses act in compliance with such illusions, despite knowing better, as if society is supposed to run in a certain way that is immune from truth, alterity, and the existential duty to think critically about what one experiences. The mantra, yes, I know, but, but still, encapsulates this form of disavowal, where knowledge is suspended for the illusion of otherwise. The scriptures of ideology tell them what to think, how to act, what to say and do, and relieve them of, of their onus for which they passively acquiesce through blind obedience and consumer fetishism. Here people become conditioned sheep in the meadow who interpassively assign over any personal powers of decision-making to an abstract power that structured their lives through hegemonic social fantasies that are unconsciously enacted as though they are staged for a virtual audience. In inner passivity, we attribute to the mythical other any requirement we, we may have to participate in or adopt through forms of displacement. Others and objects are assigned the role of the active participant while the interpassive subject merely observes its own delegated enjoyment through being represented by something or someone else. Yet interpassivity that is initially thought to be merely subjective, that is confined to the idiosyncratic experiences of the individual, is in fact upheld by objective illusions. Others, apart from actors, must believe in these illusions. And such realizations function as substitutions for the subject's own disavowed and displaced interiority. Let us apply this concept of illusions without owners to obsessional religious actions. Religious uh, doctrines and rituals, regardless of the type of religion, have always been others' convictions without having been our own. They are the other's desire superimposed on the populace of any society in which any culture involuntarily adopts as transcendental illusions that one never really thinks about critically until they reach the age of reason. Yet they form the cultural edifice and social fabric of a given set of expectations 
one is coerced into believing because almost everyone around them thinks and acts in this manner. This is the most salient in childhood where questioning adult authority is not permitted without suffering certain consequences. <coughs> the belief in God is always belief in the other's belief in its existence. And faith is always the entanglement and acceptance of the idea of God's existence that is given over by the literal or symbolic other as social illusion. In other words, one never stops to think. Rather, they just conform to social expectation, including adopting various sectarian beliefs and practices as a sacred seriousness that sustains the suspension of having to think. In, in Fowler's words, Whenever sacred seriousness reigns, there must be a denied illusion that is kept suspended. Sacred seriousness is a sign indicating the presence of an illusion of the other. It is its symptom. Here we may observe a key ingredient in ideology. Unreflective belief in the other's illusions is elevated to the realm of faith as the suspension of belief for the illusion itself no longer capable of owning any responsibility for one's own thoughts, illusions without authors become an objective social truth. There's always a deferral to some other source, some other signifier that becomes the authority which justifies the belief or faith in the idea itself. Something or someone else is always accredited to be the reason why we think and behave the way we do even the illusion itself. This insight is illuminated by observing acts of obsessive compulsive religious sacraments, whereby most ordinary votaries have no clue what the rituals actually mean or signify, as they are concealed through a collective appearance of meaning the typical worshiper lacks any understanding of whatsoever. People just go through the motions. The compelled act is merely a displacement or a substitution of what the act is supposed to symbolize, despite the fact that the devotee does not truly understand what the rite accomplishes other than deferring or assuaging a free-floating anxiety that has no locus or owner. The compulsion itself is merely in response to generated anxiety without a discernible source. The obsessional ceremonial rituals of Religious actions are intensified when, when displacement or substitution take the form of a miniaturization as a symbolic act, such as through prayer, reciting scripture, rehearsing a verse, touching a rosary or crucifix, and so on. When these manifest nonsense practices are, are designed to imprison subjects in the illusion of ownerless others, revolving around imaginative fantasies without a discernible image. Here God becomes that imageless image. Freud famously showed how these obsessional displacements onto substitute acts and ancillary compulsions serve to distance the subject further away from the real issue, namely that of any substantive justification for the obsessional ritual itself, when in reality it's merely a displacement from the actual important thing onto a small one that takes its place so that the petty ceremonials of religious practice gradually become the essential thing and push aside the underlying thoughts associated with its originating purpose. The miniature symbolic displacements onto something else as a form of distancing from the real significance of the object in question allows much of humanity a reprieve from justifying their illogic through cultural practices that promote such illusions to flourish and thrive as an appeal to custom. We may especially observe this notion of displaced symbolic miniaturization in reformed religious rituals and beliefs, where countless denominations offer their own theological reformations and reinterpretations of scripture, church structure, revamp ceremonials, modify belief systems, and so on, that act as a displacement of psychical values in, in the service of compromise functions. In Freud's view, when neurosis 
as individual religiosity is supplanted for a collective, hence universal, obsessional neurosis that appeals to the narcissism of minor differences, as seen in all various sects and reformed congregations and factions that pride themselves on reformulated identities, this re-microstructuralization speaks to the nature of institutionalized social displacement. Here reformed belief and praxis are the replacement of original fundamental values that define a particular religion in the guise of its own self-deluded notion that it is the original thing, when in fact it is merely the appearance of historical substitutions. Furthermore, when obsessionality over minor differences in reform beliefs and uh, that restructure religious rights become the locus of identity, we are carried further and further away into renegade illusion. Societies have a certain affective dependency on their illusions to the degree that their cold enjoyment makes it a need. This need intensifies emotional ties to the illusion, but of an ambivalent nature. When one is not free of their emotional dependency of an, on an illusion, it may serve as a quasi-functional addiction to repetition compulsion, the very sum and substance of obsessional neurosis sustained by perpetuating substitute activities, which temporarily serve to neutralize ambivalent internal prohibitions that are exteriorized onto a deity. Here the god introject becomes the substitute, albeit misrecognized, source of external prohibition as divine law, one that serves as a placeholder for shifting, or excuse me, for stifling inner impulse and natural desire on the one hand and instituting fear and punishment fantasies on the other. Yet this always leaves residual internal conflict and ambivalence, for many sacrifices are made unconsciously. The pious are plagued by an unconscious sense of guilt due to, due to their dispositional sin they aver to deny, as well as the compulsion to show penance and make reparation for fantasized transgressions against their own interiority. They mistakenly attribute to an external omnipotent agent they themselves have manufactured in their minds. Let's recapitulate Freud's treatise on the psychological processes of religious life. If religious practices, like obsession, obsessive actions or compromise formations, and thus originate in a defensive conflict, then ambivalence is at the beginning of religious activity and obsessional neurosis. This corresponds with the elevated sacred seriousness of the former and the compulsive character of the latter. Without ambivalence, there would be no sacred seriousness and no religion. Here, ambivalence generates the engine of displacement as a series of deferrals transposed onto miniaturizing activity, namely telescoping, minimizing um, efforts at reduction by focusing on other details rather than the original matter at hand. It, maybe that could apply to philosophers as well. Um, we, get big, we get bogged down in argument and detail. But in effect, the inner, pass, the inner passive subject, as spectator to the other's illusions, constantly refashions its disowned ambivalent internal discord through refined ruminations and nuanced activities directed toward restriction and curtailment that serve as a symptomatic substitute for focusing on one's original psychogenic conflicts, which are then dislocated onto God. Fowler notes that suspended illusions form a culture's pleasure principle, which inadvertently leads to unhappiness caused by these various illusions themselves. In effect, displacements can only go so far. Substitutions are never the real thing, and they can only be suspended so long before the psyche is confronted with its subverted operations of substitution, the meaninglessness of obsessional deferral, and deceptive truth that bears no genuine article. 
The practice of prayer and religious ceremony is a good example of miniaturized displacement as the pressing rumination on details that lose sight of the original issue. Here what is substituted is an original gratification that must be denied and converted into its opposite via disavowal, re restriction, and prohibition as a form of undoing original desire, which is then relocated on miniaturized prescriptive actions as if, as if they're the most important thing. As Freud points out, these ceremonials are concerned with the small actions of daily life and are expressed in foolish regulations and restrictions in connection with them. Here we may observe the overdetermined forces of compromise formation, where a certain pleasure is derived from the substitute act connected to the original repressed object of desire. Prayer mitigates anxiety and keeps one connected to the mental object, but it simultaneously produces obsessional worry that leads to habitual rituals designed to prolong anxiety and ambivalence as a byproduct of repetition compulsion. Prayer or going to synagogue, temple, church, mosque becomes an obligation or duty one must do rather than what one really wants to do deep down, hence ensuring the continuance of such ambivalence despite the fact that they may feel good in doing so. Although we may say that suspended illusions of others without proper agency provide the basis of a culture's pleasure principle, they are ultimately unsatisfactory as they are unsatisfying. Illusions never deliver. They are merely facades people feel impelled to construct and engage in through the persona of maintaining social appearances while chasing pleasure. World cultures that are incapable of recognizing their own illusions only lead to the perpetuation of ignorance and displeasure. As relational beings, the believing masses cannot accept the fact that we are ultimately alone and there's nothing else after we die. There's no family we return to. There's no bosom. There are no prospects of anything else other than what we experience now or create in our own process of becoming. Many mistakenly, yet quite willfully at times, create the illusion of a wishful afterlife when there's nothing beyond our natural embodiment. Of course, we can debate the question of life after death, the transmogrification of matter, mind-body dualism, reincarnation, the transmigration of souls, and so forth, which I would argue is not the same as the God question. However, it is incontestable that the death of organic life is a biological state of finality. Scientific naturalism and contemporary materialism generally argue that mind and body are, with stipulations, virtually identical and dependent upon physiological corporality, and, and that the cessation of the physical body is a terminal ending point, as any anatomist or mortician will tell you. Take, for example, the narrative myth of Christianity, which I will attempt to um, summarize in a dumb braided pithy form. We all know the story. A child is born from a virgin who is impregnated by a ghost and then proclaimed to be the Son of God, whom is then sentenced to state execution and comes back from the dead. You cannot be a faithful Christian and not believe in at least two fantastic cardinal stories, the first being a the possibility of a virgin birth, literally a woman who has not had sex with a man, and second b that a corpse can come back to life. Uh, nearly all Christians, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, believe in, in three basic tenets, the canon of New Tis Testament scripture, the apostolic creed, and three specific forms of, of church institutional structure. But the teleological suspension of the rational is the most astounding, namely the possibility of virgin birth and, and resurrection. Although it is a well-documented fact that religion is a politically driven official dome <coughs> that promotes illusory truth in the service of attaining power 
by fostering intellectual prejudice and servitude, it is unfathomable to think that anyone who is not retarded could possibly believe that a man rose from the grave. The notion of a dead man coming back to life, the myth of resur resurrection after crucifixion, is the modern day motif of a horror movie, like divine zombie returns from the dead. Here we hear the echo of Tertullian. It is certain because it's impossible. It's absurd, so it must be believed. Uh, in other words, uh, this is crazy, so it must be true. This credulity is hardly a logic remotely worth, uh, worthy of validity. We pine for futurity, heaven, as an emotional measure to overcome death. We don't want to stop experiencing. The will to live is instinctual, as the notion of continuation ensures a psychic sense of permanence, for we simply do not want life to end. What we call God, what we think of as an object relation, is really a self-relation to a wishful idea we imagine is an otherworldly, divine, and beatific, supernatural, yet personal, being that exists and who we are in communion with when we are, in fact, only relating to our own minds. This self-relation is indeed an internalized and conscious relation to an idealized object turned into a reified and deified subject when this fantasy object is in essence a fixation to an idealization of imagined value. In psychoanalytic terms, we could, ref we could refer to the God posit as a product of the ego ideal, which interjects a confusion between wish and reality and attenuates appropriate boundaries belonging to critical judgment in favor of an exemplar view of an ideal self that is impossible to attain, yet displaced onto a superior, more, superior moral agency. Jesus of, Na of Nazareth is a good example of the ego ideal, what Jungians refer to as an archetypal image of a perfect self. Yet this fixation to an idealized value object is tantamount to a delusion, for there is no substantive evidence to prove the facticity of the belief that the ideal, as idea, is a metaphysical entity apart from the psychological motives that underlie the invention of the idea itself. If what we understand by delusion is the fixed belief in something contrary to all evidence against it, then this imaginary idealized object may only belong to the ideational fixations fashioned by psychic reality. And when this intrapsychic process uh, becomes socially conditioned and fortified in cultural identity, fixated belief becomes a collective folly le doux. An element of our superego, the seat of conscience and moral judgment, that which stands over and above us in developmental importance and idealized value, is itself a valuing microagent or, or part of our personality that is invested in construing a fantasy system of perfection in all its myriad forms, particularly an ultimate object of idealized value. The believer, I suggest, as opposed to a person of faith, harbors a delusional nucleus in the sense that a valued object is extraordinarily idealized and worshipped as a substitute for one's fallible earthly objects. Uh, this could be anything, um, one's parents, society, the fatherland, big other, so forth. What is essential, that is indispensable, is that an idealized object is worshipped for its imagined ideal value. In other words, the fantasized object of worship is the delusional idealization of imagined value that is attached to the fixated object within the fantasy constellation itself. For the large majority of humanity throughout the world, God and its semiotic derivatives symbolize ideality, the conception of absolute perfection. 
This is none other than what we prize or cherish above all else, the good, the true, the beautiful, pure excellence. As our self-relation to ideality, God becomes a signifier for the highest form of valuation imaginable. And the hallowed relationship we form with our values, what we find most worthy, may be the most consecrated covenant that governs the law of the heart, namely the moral principles that define selfhood and what we conceivably live and die for. If this were not the case, then the history of religious conflict throughout the world in the name of God would be a vacuous testament to human stupidity. Thank you.